begin transmission. This past week has been pretty tough for the crew, what with uh, the murder and then the trial and then the exile and all that. So we all felt like we needed a victory, some, some even just a small win. And so what we finally did was we all got together and proposed some names for this beautiful planet that we've been spending our last few months. Because up till now, as you know, we've just been calling it this planet. Or by its formal designation, um, TOI-700D. And uh, But we need a more, more homey name for it. As you know, this planet is part of the Dorado galaxy, about 101.4 light years from Earth and it's a nice little rocky exoplanet orbiting a red dwarf star and formally TOI 700D but that doesn't exactly roll off the tongue so uh, the crew got together and we voted to name this planet um, Solara and Solara comes from the ancient Dumidian word for a new hope because that is what we hope this planet will be um, for humans as, as they try to kind of um, restart, um, have a new a new start, and hopefully a more successful start than they had on Earth. And the humans are hoping for a new hope, and the androids are hoping for a new hope, so it's one thing we can all agree on and get, get along about. So Solara is the name of this planet. It means um, a new hope, and we're very excited to um, call it that. <laughs> Calling this planet by its name has just given us a reinvigorated our crew it's given us life you know after we had that uh, the doctor astronomer's death and that phantom menace hanging over us we didn't know who was responsible and um, finally we've gotten dr cordaceris out he turned um, turns out he just went rogue one day and decided to commit murder so i'm glad he's gone and i'm glad our, our little crew little here this little empire um, struck back against the the forces that um, were trying to overwhelm us so I think we, we're all, we all feel like we're in a, in a much better place, um, especially now that um, Dr. Cordaceris is off solo on Snake Island. Um, and who knows what he's up to um, these days. But I wanted to tell you what we have been up to these days. We've still been exploring this planet, and I'm excited to tell you about reptiles today, uh, particularly um, snakes. Snakes have always been fascinating to me, and we've been um, collecting more and more and more of them. Um, as we've been here, um, again, been kind of avoiding Snake Island because of the, the, the venomous vipers there, um, but at least one member of our crew will be very well acquainted with them um, by the end of his life. And so uh, what I want to show you right now, um, kind of truncate this rambling bit a little bit, I want to show you this, this beautiful hog-nosed um, snake. And what happens when you kind of pester this hognose snake, it has a really amazing defensive reaction. It pretends to be dead. Starts writhing around, turns upside down, and just wiggles about. It even sticks its tongue out. And it's really committed to this, uh, this playing dead bit. It's even getting his mouth full of sand. It's a very committed even when you turn it back over, it just flips itself back over. It is insisting that it's dead. And I can just really appreciate that commitment to a bit. Because sometimes in life, you start something and it seems like a good idea at the time, but it gets really difficult and maybe a little confusing and you want to quit, but you're, you're committed and you don't know where it's going to end up or how it's going to um, be when all things are said and done. But um, I'm just trying to be like this little hognose snake in my life. If you start something, you just got to commit to it and finish it. So we have started this, um, this journey here on this planet, and even though we've had crew members die or be exiled, we're going to keep going, persist through to the end, and hopefully give us all a, a new hope. Last time we talked about amniotes and their diversity. And there are three lineages of amniotes that are, are most important for us to, to get to know. The first is the reptiles, the second is the birds, and the third is the mammals. And um, technically birds are reptiles, so if you look back at the phylogenetic tree, um, you'll find that the archosaurian lineage, which includes the birds and the um, crocodiles, are uh, is paraphyletic to the other lepidosaur lineage with the 
um, snakes and lizards and friends. So birds are phylogenetically speaking reptiles, but um, colloquially speaking, we, it's very easy to identify a bird from a gecko, right? This gecko right here, this, this leaf-tailed gecko, looks very different than an ostrich or a hummingbird. It's easy to group them apart. So even though phylogenetically speaking, they're all one group, it makes a lot more sense to talk about them separately. So today we'll talk about the non-avian reptiles, the lizards, snakes, um, sphenodonts, crocodilians, and turtles. What makes a reptile a reptile? And keep in mind here that these, this, this, all the information here could be applied to birds as well. Um, so this is also another good question for, you know, why are birds reptiles? First of all, you'll notice um, scales, right? Reptiles are well known for their scales. This beautiful eyelash viper has um, keeled scales on his body, and it just looks um, absolutely stunning. Those scales are made from a um, from a substance called beta keratin, and bird's feathers are made from beta keratin as well. And bird feathers and scales, this is an epidermal tissue of, of beta keratin, um, so it comes from the epidermis rather than the dermis. And in mammals, the hair of mammals is made from alpha keratin. So that's a difference. Um, so birds and, re and other reptiles, snakes, both have beta keratin scales or feathers, and mammals have alpha keratin feathers, um, fur, hairs. And if you re recall, the scales of fish have an epidermal keratin-like layer as well, but the, the core of a, a fish's scales is in the dermis. Um, reptiles don't have dermal scales, except for some which have these little things called osteoderms, and osteoderms are found in the dermis, and they're kind of reminiscent of the fish's scales. Even if you have osteoderms, you're going to have the beta keratin scales on top of that. In turtles, turtles have um, specialized scales called scutes, which form these hard plates over their, over the, over their um, shells. And um, so scutes are specialized beta keratin scales on turtles. And then osteoderms, I just mentioned these, but here is a shingleback lizard and some um, skinks like these and some crocodilians, they're gonna have uh, kind of bony plated armor and it's an osteoderm, the bone in the dermal layer underneath the epidermal scales. There are four clades within clade reptilia and for ease, ease I'm gonna treat these as orders and uh, reptilia as a class, <clears throat> but you should know that uh, reptilia is, and all of these orders are really better conceived of as clades rather than orders because some of the taxonomy is um, paraphyletic, <clears throat> but to make this easy for us and make it consistent with our previous taxonomy. Um, I'm gonna call this class Reptilia and order Sphenodonta, order Squamata, order Testudines, and order Crocodilia. So we'll begin with the Sphenodonts. These are a really unique group of lizard-like animals. They're lepidosaurs, and if you look back at the amniote phylogeny um, picture, you'll see that Tuataras in order Sphenodonta are kind of an ancient lineage um, that predates kind of the split between uh, snakes and lizards. So a lot of their traits are um, plesiomorphic, which means they're kind of ancestral. And um, so what you're looking at here is kind of a living fossil, something that looks the way it did, um, let's see, over 70 million years ago. <laughs> so Order Sphenodonta are two Ataras, and they inhabit an island, New Guinea, and uh, where they are, uh, they get to be about two feet long. They kind of look iguana-like, but they're they're not iguanas. They have a different um, skull morphology. Because they live on an island, they um, and the island doesn't have any predators. They have evolved to be kind of lazy species. They uh, they are really slow metabolic speed. Um, they have really low metabolic rates. They're very slow moving animals, and it takes them about ten years to reach sexual maturity and then they only lay a few eggs at a time. So their species grows very slowly in population and they're extremely vulnerable to predators. What makes them uh, really interesting is that on their foreheads, right here, they have a very large scale and underneath that scale is an eye. They actually have three eyes. 
this uh, the this eye on the on their forehead is called a parietal eye, and um, it's just a really curious, mysterious feature. It seems to um, help them track seasonal changes and maintain circadian rhythm patterns. Um, so it's it seems to be sensitive to the lunar cycle, and so something about light and uh, moon, light seasons, daylight. Um, so it regulates a reproductive behavior around seasons and hibernation and all the kind of um, uh, seasonal changes that the body uh, un undergoes. So this is a really interesting, interesting little feature. In humans, this uh, the corollary to this is a little um, gland in our brains called the pineal gland, and which also regulates our circadian rhythms. So in these tuataras, that gland is basically just up on the surface instead of deep in their brains. So the parietal eye important for circadian rhythm and seasonal changes. Turtles are in um, order Testudines. Uh, Testudines, the the most uh, you guys know about turtles, they're going to have shells and they're going to have beaks. So these are a pretty interesting reptiles. Very um, very unique. No no other animal in the world has a shell like a turtle shell. It's made from two components, a carapace on top and a plastron on um, the ventral side. And these are bone, and uh, the carapace, at least, fuses with the backbone of the turtle. So it's almost an extension of the backbone. It's a solid core piece. It's not secreted by the, um, by the dermis or the epidermis. It's part of its skeleton. So the carapace on the dorsal part, plastron on the ventral part. Some species, um, like this guy, um, are, the tortoise live on land, whereas sea turtles are obviously marine, and they can achieve um, really long lives, over a hundred years uh, for some of these tortoises and turtles. Very Fairly slow metabolism, which helps extend their life, um, but fairly slow moving, slow living, slow thinking, but uh, very patient and wise creatures. The plastron in some species, like a terrestrial box turtles, actually has a hinge on it, and they can completely withdraw all their arms and legs into their nice little box shell and be protected from predators. Others don't have much of a shell at all. This is a pancake or soft shell um, turtle, and this one lives in water, in fresh water, kind of buried deep in the mud, and um, it has a highly reduced shell. Others have a shell, and instead of retracting their head into it, they have to wrap their head around it. This is the, the snake-necked um, turtle, and it also buries itself deep in mud and uses its nice little um, nostrils to and long neck to breathe air while it's waiting in the mud for prey. A very, very diverse group, uh, marine life, um, marines, marine turtles, terrestrial turtles, um, river turtles, and um, yeah, it's turtles. Oh, the most uh, amazing thing about turtles is that they love to dance. Absolutely love dancing. The, the epidermal scales actually are sensitive uh, to touch, so they have nerve endings in them. So if you scratch a turtle's back, it can feel it and it usually likes it. This little guy is getting a nice little hot shower. Presumably warm, I don't know. Turtles are primarily vegetarian and they'll eat all kinds of um, fruits and berries and grasses, but there are a few predatory species like the, this alligator snapping turtle, which has a modified tongue that looks like a little wiggly worm, and when a fish comes to eat the worm, the fish gets chomped. So this guy buries itself deep in the mud, and oftentimes just its little wiggly tongue is visible as it eats. So primarily herbivorous, but there are some predatory species. No parasites um, in this group, so this is one of the few groups where there are no parasites. There's no parasitic turtles. Um, turtles primarily find each other by smell. Um, they don't make a lot of noise, um, and actually most of the noise, most turtles are mute except during breeding season, and um, so they don't find each other by sight or by sound. They're going to use um, smell, and once they find each other, they'll mate and lay eggs in um, a nice cl clutch of eggs buried underneath sand. So even the marine turtles will come to shore to bury their eggs in um, sand. So no matter where they are, they're going to bury their eggs. And then um, the eggs, interestingly, the, the temperature of the nest 
dictates the sex of the offspring. So in a um, high temperature nest, the offspring will be female. Low temperature, the offspring will be male. For sea turtles, um, they have to get back to the ocean immediately. And when they hatch, they may all make a mad dash to the ocean to escape from predators. Oftentimes, the hatching of sea turtles is timed with the breeding of a lot of um, seagulls and other marine um, beach predators. And so the, all the beach predators are waiting for these little sea turtles to hatch so that they can feed their young. So it's a very dangerous time in the life of a sea turtle. This is actually when most um, death happens. Lizards and snakes belong to order Squamata. We'll talk about the lizards first and then the snakes. Lizards are the most diverse group of reptiles um, currently, and they include such creatures like uh, the iguanas, which have these, these interesting crests on the back and um, throat um, folds. These are mostly herbivorous species, and uh, most, most lizards are um, predators, but many iguanas are herbivorous. And they're just really elaborately decorated, really interesting dinosaur-like creatures. Then you have the Komodo dragons, which are these um, which represent the monitor lineage. And monitor lizards um, are s some of the biggest lizards still in existence. The Komodo dragon, six feet long, can weigh several hundred pounds, and can chase down a deer. Also has some venomous saliva, <clears throat> a really pretty, pretty nasty uh, brutish animal with armor-plated skin. Um, and you'll notice that it's sticking its tongue out and its tongue is forked. <clears throat> the monitor lizard lineage, some people think that it is from these creatures that the snakes eventually um, evolved. So monitor lizards are the sister group to um, the snakes. You also have uh, lizards called skinks and skinks are famous for their kind of um, very thick osteoderm scales. So they have uh, bony plates. And this particular one is the blue-tongued skink, which, when threatened, has this really bright blue um, fat tongue, which will flop out as an um, intimidating display or as a shocking display to kind of freeze the predator in place while it scurries away. My favorite lineage um, of lizards are the geckos. Geckos are primarily nocturnal. And um, as you can see from here, they have a, a large external ear, so hearing is really important. They are some of the most vocal species, and their, their toe pads are famous for being uh, microscopically um, adhesive. They're incredibly adhesive. The, uh, the geckos can walk on the surface of glass upside down, and so their, their toe pads are phenomenally sticky. And really amazing, beautiful, tropical um, lizards. My other favorite group of lizards are the chameleons. Chameleons are um, have chromatophores um, scattered throughout their epidermis and so they can change colors based on mood and so they communicate to rivals and to mates their their mood um, and by, by their changing colors. They also have eyes that can look in two different directions and an extremely long um, elastic tongue that can shoot out two feet to catch prey. And then they have these weird grippy feet that they use to walk along branches. Just a really unique uh, collection of features in um, chameleons. So those are in general the, the lizards. And how you can tell a lizard from <clears throat> a salamander is uh, check out the skin, right? Salamanders have um, soft, moist, cutaneous respiratory skin and lizards have epidermal scales. Um, you can also look at um, the eyelids. So lizards are going to have movable eyelids that they can use to keep their eyes clean and they have external ears. A lot of the lizards are vocal and most reptiles are not very vocal. They don't make a lot of sound. So lizards are pretty unique in, in that respect. Lizards also have a highly kinetic skull. If you remember um, reptiles, uh, birds, and um, these guys have diapsid skulls and they have a complex musculature that attaches to those holes and lets their jaws um, chew and grab and bite. Um, this little um, lizard has caught a scorpion and um, they actually chew it up a little bit before swallowing it um, whole, but it lets them get prey in a, a terrestrial environment much more efficiently. So movable eyelids, an external ear, and a kinetic skull differentiate lizards from um, other, all other reptiles. 
they also shed their epidermis in in, um, in kind of one piece. So uh, turtles don't really shed, um, snakes and lizards shed, and uh, this is pretty characteristic of this species. So the epidermal layer sheds. A lot of um, lizards have adapted to living in desert environments, and they can do this because they have a really efficient kidney system that concentrates all their, their extra water um, into a uric acid metabolic waste um, secretion. So they can exploit a lot of really unique habitats that other animals are excluded from because of their inefficient kidneys. This creature right here is a Gila monster, a very unique looking animal. And um, in the desert, desert environments are kind of feast or famine. There's long periods of drought and then there's um, abundant food in short periods of time. So the Gila monster during um, feast times, it eats as much as it can, and then it stores all this extra fat in its tails. So if you see a really healthy Gila monster, its tail will almost look like a second body because it's, it's so ch uh, chunky. And then during times of famine, it can uh, metabolize all that extra fat for energy. So you can store excess energy in their tails. Lizard reproduction is one of the primary reasons they are very vocal, and so oftentimes the males will stake out territory and communicate to um, females and other males using vocalizations. Um, oftentimes there's there's territorial displays as well, like this, this beautiful um, blue throat uh, pouched lizard, and this one uh, is communicating to other males that this is his territory and also trying to attract the attention of, of females. Um, a lot of um, animals, a lot of lizards will reproduce um, with males, obviously, but there are some species, especially of monitor lizards, that can reproduce parthenogenetically, and so no males need to be present. The female can actually um, give birth to her own um, cluster of eggs, and these will then are essentially clones of their mother, of course. And oftentimes when they're young, the monitor lizards will hunt together and this little attack, attack of the clones can take down um, prey much larger than an individual can. So most of the time dioecious, uh, most of the time not parental care, but in monitor lizards, there can be some parental care and there can be some parthenogenesis. And I can't uh, leave, this doesn't have anything to do with reproduction, but um, I have to show you this picture of the frilled lizard, which has this amazing um, head frill all around it that it inflates when it's, when it's frightened. And then this Draco flying dragon lizard has um, a little frill on its sides and it can use, it uses this to glide from tree to tree. So there's really some phenomenal um, frills in the lizard world. Snakes are the other group within order Squamata and really famous for being um, limbless predators. A lot of them are venomous, but most of them are, are relatively harmless. And major lineages are gonna include the cobras, which have an extensible um, throat frill that they inflate when they're intimidating. We have the boa constrictors and pythons, which are usually ambush predators and constrict their prey and squeeze the life out of them. We think of pythons as being kind of the nice snakes, but they've got some pretty nasty teeth. This is the teeth of, a, of an emerald tree boa. And so these are predators, um, but they, they're fairly docile predators, but I still wouldn't want to be bitten by one. And then we have um, the garter snakes, which are a plentiful group of really harmless snakes. Garter snakes are fascinating um, during the winter. They, they congregate in these large nests, and during the spring, they all kind of come out together, and it's, they just adorably explore their, their newfound spring world. Oh, I didn't mention vipers in the back. You see the, the green viper, so that's another important lineage of venomous snakes. So we have vipers, cobras, pythons, and garter snakes. Snakes are going to differ from other um, squamates, um, particularly lizards, because they have fixed eyelids. So remember, lizards have uh, movable eyelids, and snakes also don't have an external ear. Um, when was the last time you hear, heard a snake say something? Well, I guess Harry Potter. But most snakes don't talk, and so most snakes don't need to hear. Um, they don't communicate to mates with uh, vocalizations, typically, so ears are not very important. What is important for snakes is um, sensing vibrations. So their bodies are very close to the earth, very earthy creatures, 
and so their bodies are very sensitive to substrate vibrations. And um, similar to lizards, they have a kinetic skull, but the, the skulls of um, snakes are highly kinetic, so just phenomenally um, transformative. Um, the, the skulls uh, of this egg-eating snake can completely envelop a prey larger than its head, and this is accomplished because the, the jaws the lower jaw actually can disarticulate and um, it's not connected it's connected with connective tissue rather than bone so if you feel your chin the two your left and right jaws are connected at your chin with a bone but at the at the chin of a snake um, it's just elastic so they can actually move their jaws independently and here you can see how wide an anaconda can open its mouth which is just incredible like the camera even have to, has to zoom out to see how big that snake can open its mouth. And then here is a rattlesnake where you can see it's stretching and you can see it, there's basically four parts to its jaw. It's not a solid structure. Really pretty remarkable. Now, how do you tell the difference between a snake and a lizard? <clears throat> Most people think this is easy, right? Lizards have legs, snakes don't. But what you're looking at here is a legless lizard and what you're looking at here is a legged snake. So there are some snakes that have little stubby legs and there are some lizards that are limbless. In fact, um, leglessness as a trait has evolved over 17 times in um, order squamata. So it seems to be a very common, uh, commonly, common adaptation to life on the ground, especially if you're burrowing. So limblessness isn't going to be um, the the right thing to look for. What you should look for are the external ears. So this guy, you have the external ears. This guy doesn't. <clears throat> this one is another really strange, uh, it's, a, it's a lizard, but it's kind of in the process of losing its limbs. This is kind of a, a mole lizard that uses its fossorial front legs to dig and its hardened head to burrow, um, but it has a really long ext extensive body. So there's all kinds of really strange intermediate forms between snakes and lizards. What do you think about this one? Snake or lizard? Well, you have the external ear hole right there, so this is a lizard. Also, look at that stern face. Snakes are always kind of happy. Uh, lizards are, are, are more grumpy. So this is, this is a lizard. And um, also, if you look at the skeletons, snakes typically have fairly short tails. So you can look at the ribs and you can see an extensive rib cage and a very short tail. Lizards, oftentimes the, the, um, the tail is still rather long. So the rib cage is much shorter. So if you have a skeleton, you should be able to tell fairly easily. And then you look at this smile on this snake. So uh, lizards are fairly stern. Snakes are usually a little smiley. Snakes use their tongues to sense their environment. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that they're really sensitive to substrate vibrations, uh, but they have this fantastic system of olfaction. In the roof of their mouth, there is something called Jacobson's organ, and when they stick out their moist tongue into the air, it picks up little chemical particles, and then they, put, they flick that tail into their um, little mouth organ up there, and that's how they smell. So it's very sensitive um, to chemicals and they can track prey and avoid predators um, by doing this. So fairly unique sensory organ. In pit vipers, um, pit vipers are have a fantastic little superpower where they can detect um, heat differences. So this is, they basically see like this, this is a thermal image and you can see there's a snake eating a rat or something. And mammals, which are the pit vipers go to prey, are warm blooded endothermic. They're generating their own body heat. And so they stand out against the background like a beacon of delicious food. Um, so snakes, uh, pit vipers can see um, thermal uh, vision, which is really fantastic. Snake venom, there are two major lineages with uh, toxic venom, the vipers and the elapids, the vipers and the cobras. Um, this cobra here is the spitting cobra. Um, both vipers and cobras have um, fangs that they use to inject venom, but the, the fangs are how you distinguish vipers from um, cobras. Vipers, the fangs are hinged, 
And so oftentimes they're very long and when the snake opens its mouth, they unhinge to stab their prey. And so in vipers, their head is usually a triangular shape so it can house their very long fangs. Cobras are fixed fang snakes. They don't have long fangs and their fangs aren't hinged. So they uh, just look like normal snakes. They don't have the triangle shaped heads. This is a spitting cobra and its fangs are hollow and uh, with a, an opening in the front. And when their um, venom glands are secreted, secrete the venom, it flows into their teeth and then out with a force that can extend for several meters. And they aim it at the eyes of their uh, predators. So this is a really pretty phenomenal defense mechanism. Cobras typically have neurotoxic venom. Contrast that with vipers, which again have the triangular shaped eyes. Um, pit vipers have these distinctive pits for detecting heat. And uh, pit vipers usually have hemotoxic or cytotoxic venom. This is a ne necrotic muscle destroying tissue. This is what happens with a drop of blood of rattlesnake, a drop of rattlesnake venom in a cup of blood. You can see the blood just coagulates and becomes all goopy. So rattlesnake venom is very bad for you. Uh, the next picture is really gross. This is a result of a um, viper bite. So hemolytic toxin isn't going to be systemic. It's going to be localized, but it's going to destroy all your, all your, all your, t all your tissue. And um, specifically, a lot of vipers have something called a myotoxin, which destroys all your muscles throughout your body. And it essentially causes your muscle tissue, your, your myofibrils to disintegrate. And then um, they get past your bloodstream and you urinate them out. So essentially what is happening is you're peeing out your muscles as they deteriorate. So it leads to kidney failure um, and is incredibly painful. Snakes find each other with pheromones during the breeding season, and um, uh, snakes and uh, male snakes have what's called a, a hemipenis, which is um, uh, part of the cloacal wall, is can be extended out to transfer sperm to the female. Lizards have this too, and and so that's how you tell tell a ma uh, tell a male from a female is this um, kind of extra cloacal wall feature inside uh, the male. So the hemipenis is used to transfer sperm to the females during breeding season. And then eggs are usually uh, laid and then abandoned, but uh, pythons are pretty famous for caring for their young. And, um, m but most, most species don't have any kind of parental care. The, the species with the most parental care are actually um, vipers. Um, vipers actually uh, will care for their young after birth, and that's one of the only known groups of snakes to do that, uh, or squamates in general. Squamates usually don't make very good parents. So usually eggs are laid and then parents uh, take off. Crocodilians are the, our last group of reptiles to talk about today. And crocodiles are a um, really fascinating group, a really ancient archosaurian lineage, right? And if you remember, uh, birds and crocodiles are um, sister taxa of the current reptiles. And it's just amazing that, um, because this does not look like a, a hummingbird, right? It's not, it does not look like a robin or a sparrow. And so crocodiles have been along before um, the evolution of birds. Sometimes people melodramatically call the, the evolution of birds the rise of the skywalkers, um, which doesn't really make sense to me because they're not really walking in the sky. That's kind of the point. But <clears throat> I don't make the rules. Um, so the, the crocodiles have been around for a very, very long time. It's a very ancient lineage. And they kind of look a little ancient -y. There are three primary groups. We have the gharials, which are specialized um, piscivores, fish eaters. They have long, um, kind of pan-shaped heads with um, long, pointy teeth, perfect for stabbing a squirming fish. <clears throat> and then we have crocodiles and alligators. And the difference between crocodiles and alligators is you look at their, their smiles. Crocodiles have kind of up-down teeth can see both um, dorsal and ventral teeth and in alligators usually it's just the dorsal teeth visible pointing down. Also another difference is in alligators you will often see them later but crocodiles you'll see them after a while. Crocodiles being this ancient lineage are very different than 
other reptiles. They have osteoderms, very thick osteoderms throughout their body. They have really um, extremely powerful swimming tails. They can actually elevate their whole body out of the water with just their tails. And um, precisely, particularly, especially, specifically, they have teeth set in sockets, and this is unusual. And this is actually, both of these features are actually kind of mammalian features, which is, which is a little strange, um, but teeth are set in sockets, and then they have a complete secondary palate. The secondary palate is basically kind of think of the roof of your mouth. It separates the, the nostril respiration from the um, throat respiration. And so this is important for crocodiles when they're breathing air um, with their body underwater through their nostrils, or if they're, they're needing to breathe while they have a mouth full of food, they can still do that. During the reproductive season, um, the uh, male alligators often are very loud and they do this really interesting little mating ritual where they'll create these really deep rumbly vocalizations and kind of the water will dance and shake around them. And that's how they um, attract females and warn males away. Mating usually occurs <clears throat> underwater and then the eggs are laid in an especially made nest that the mother makes. And then once the eggs hatch, um, oh, similarly to turtles, the, the sex is determined by the nest temperature, but it's the opposite. So in turtles, high mint um, females and low temperature mint males. In crocodilians, it's the opposite. So high temperatures mean males and low temperatures mean females. Uh, but oftentimes there is a, um, the, they kind of lay their eggs in kind of like a compost heap. And so there is heat generated in the nest and um, so there's actually a, a sex and temperature gradient from the, the eggs at the lower end of the nest and the eggs at the highest uh, part of the nest. So you typically don't have a nest of all males or females. There's still a good about 50-50 ratio most of the time. Once the eggs hatch, they'll start squeaking and chirping, uh, and they can't really claw out of this, this compound post heat by themselves. And so when the mother hears this scurping, um, squeaking and chirping, um, something um, happens, it kind of a force awakens inside her and she rushes over and digs them all out and then um, carries them around for a while. You see this cute little mama and the cute little babies. Um, so there's rather extensive maternal care in crocodilians. Um, she will take care of them, help them food, help them find food for about two years until they're old enough to fend for themselves. Um, but then um, they better leave or she will eat them. So it's, uh, it's very nice parental care up to a certain point and then it's on their own. So those are, those are all the reptiles. Um, tuataras, turtles, snakes, lizards, and crocodilians. One more story I need to share with you uh, very briefly is about a turtle, this, this uh, beautiful, unique white turtle. And uh, turtles are not usually social, but when they're born, they all um, they all you know emerge together and then wander down to the beach together. And we were watching some sea turtles hatch a while ago when we first got here. And as they migrated through, we noticed that a few of them were albino. They were white. So we have a picture here of one of them. One of them I grew very attached to. I named him the Smith because I always thought that was a cool name. And so the Smith became my favorite little turtle, and we tracked them as they as they kind of made their migrations as they grew up. And there were four of these little albino turtles in this batch, and uh, we we named them collectively the the um, the Yeti because it's kind of a mythological callback to some of Earth's most fantastic white mythological unique creatures. And collectively, we called them the Yeti. Uh, plural of Yeti. <laughs> and when these um, these little turtles grew up, they became uh, larger and they started vying for territory between other turtles, the, the normal colored ones and the white ones. And uh, we noticed that the white ones were a little bit picked on by usually the larger and more normal males until there was only one left, the last of the Yeti. And we actually lost track of him for a long time, and I thought we had lost poor Mr. the Smith. And uh, it made me very sad, but that's, that's the way of life. Sometimes things are small and don't get their fair share of resources, or mates, or uh, whatever. 
Um, but then in this past uh, this past few months, the tracker got um, uh, came back within range, and I tracked him down, and it was him, the Return of the Jedi, and this this beautiful little. Um, turtle had grown up. I don't know what kind of resources he found, but he was gigantic now, much bigger than all of his rival males, and he came around and just thrashed all the males and took over all this little territory of sea turtles that we've been monitoring. So it was it was a pretty fantastic um, revenge of the smith. And so I think that's all I need to say. I think I got, um, got through everything I needed to say in this lecture. So um, I hope you have a nice day. I'll see you next time in transmission.